But when you're playing uh, any game, you'll notice that you have a lot of different audio coming in at once. You might have a soundtrack playing while you have sound effects playing, uh, and you might have like clicks from um, menu buttons being hovered over while you can hear other things going on in the game. So there's a, uh, you can have a lot of different things going on at once when it comes to audio. And what we're going to try to do is represent each one of the audio categories as different soundtracks. So go ahead and take a look at rows four through six here. We'll focus our attention here. And what we want to try to build out is a system of audio tracks that we can control with uh, audio types. So here we'll see on row four, we have an audio track for soundtracks specifically. And then we might have uh, different audio types represented by columns B through E here. So for audio track one, we would have uh, soundtrack one, soundtrack two, soundtrack three, and soundtrack four, which could play on that audio track. For audio track two, we have designated for sound effects. So that could be um, UI sound effects or anything that's sort of like a one to two second clip. So here we have SFX one, SFX two, and SFX three. Uh, those are the only audio types that would play on that audio track two. And then we have a third audio track as an example, which we could just say is our gun audio track, where we have SFX reload, shoot, and misfire audio types playing on that soundtrack. So the rules are that only one uh, audio type could be playing for a given soundtrack. So for instance, we can't have soundtrack one and soundtrack two. We can't have soundtrack one and soundtrack two uh, both playing simultaneously on uh, audio track one because those contain the same audio source. Uh, we can, however, have soundtrack one SFX1 and SFX shoot playing all simultaneously uh, simultaneously together because each one of those audio types use different audio tracks. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, that's kind of how we want to tackle this problem. So we're going to end up creating some custom objects to help us um, sort of control these uh, data. So we're going to have an audio track definition. The audio track is going to contain an audio source, which is a, uh, a Unity object. And then it's also going to contain an array of audio objects, which is another object that we will create um, as a custom type. So the audio object is simply defined by an audio type, which is an enumeration that we're going to define, and an audio clip associated with the audio type. Audio clip is also a unity object. So here on uh, rows 13 to 22, uh, we have an audio table. So audio table is going to be a hash table that we actually end up populating in our audio controller script. And this is going to be a, uh, a hash table that defines the relationship between audio types and audio tracks. Uh, because essentially what we want to do is uh, for anybody who's using the audio controller, we simply want them to be able to pass in audio types, which is that enumerated value, in order to play a given soundtrack. So we don't want the user of the audio controller to have to worry about the audio tracks or the audio objects or the clips or any of that. Uh, we only want them to worry about which audio type they want to play. So to help us manage this quickly, we're going to have an audio table where which every single audio type um, has this relationship with an audio track. Along with that, on rows 24 through 26 here, uh, we're going to define another hash table called a uh, job table. And the job table is going to let us know which audio types have active running jobs. So the job is actually going to be a coroutine, um, which is a, a method that sort of executes over time away from the uh, core game loop. And what we have these jobs for is to manage uh, sort of more complex behavior with our audio. So we're going to do something very basic but uh, while still requiring the, uh, the coroutine. And that is the process of fading audio in and out. And so this uh, requires us to use coroutines because it ends up helping out a lot. 
and we want the ability to have a quick access table where we can just pass in an audio type and then get that coroutine so we can uh, stop that if we need to. Okay, so now that we've sort of defined the problem and how we plan to tackle it, let's go ahead and go back to Unity and uh, sort of define some of the scripts that we need to create. Okay, so here we are in our Unity project. This is part three of Unity Game Essentials. If you haven't been following along and you want to know more about data management or menu management, you can check out some of the previous tutorials. Uh, but in this tutorial, we're of course going to start covering audio. So the first thing we want to do is go to our Unity core folder and add a new folder, a new subfolder, and we're going to call this audio. And in our audio folder, we're going to create a few scripts. So first and foremost, we're going to have the audio controller. Then we're going to have a separate script for audio type. And that script is going to contain the, the public enumeration for all of our sound effect types. Then we're finally going to create a test script. This is going to be called test audio. So let's go ahead and open these scripts up and then start getting to work on these. Okay, and the first thing that we wanna do is sort of clean things up, start from scratch, and we're going to start off in the Unity Core namespace. And that's gonna be unitycore.audio. And uh, I get rid of these using namespaces uh, initially, just so I know that I have a full understanding of any namespaces that I need to add. So we are going to end up using hash tables. So I know when I get to that point, I'll end up adding the namespace for that. So we wanna start off by sort of drawing out the skeleton for our audio controller system. But before we do that, I wanna go ahead and go to our test audio script and uh, do sort of what we've been doing before, which is defining some of the testing functions um, and it's sort of how we want uh, the API to look. If a developer was using this audio controller, how would we want them to interact with the audio controller system? That is what the test script is going to give us the ability to do um, and sort of practice with very well. So uh, we're going to have a reference to our audio controller in here. We'll make that a public reference and drag that in from the inspector. So we'll have public audio controller and then we'll call that audio controller just like this. And of course, I wanna get rid of these namespaces just to keep things clean. All right, and then we're going to have the preprocessor definition for uh, whether or not this is the Unity editor. And then also around that, I'll just add a region for Unity functions just to keep things organized. And uh, this stuff is pretty, uh, the things that I'm doing now are pretty optional. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do it, but uh, over the years of developing with Unity and C Sharp, I found that sort of organizing code in this fashion kind of helps uh, whenever you leave the project for a while and then you come back to it. Uh, it's just easier to get back into. So we're going to have an update function and then of course we're going to check for input so that we can test certain things. Uh, so we're going to test the ability to sort of play audio, stop audio, and restart audio. Those are the three main functions that we really care about for now at least. So let's go ahead and uh, write some logic for that. But before I do that, uh, I did have some people saying that the text was a little bit too small, so I'm going to go ahead and increase the size there. Hope that helps. Hope that's big enough. Um, and then we can go ahead and create some conditions here. So um, let's just write if input dot get key up, and then we'll check for key code dot t. Um, so let's say if we press t, then we want to play a certain audio type. So we can say audio controller dot play audio, and then we're just gonna pass an enumerated type, uh, which we haven't created yet, but that's going to be called audio type. And let's just say we have a definition in, in that enumeration for a soundtrack, some generic soundtrack, um, st underscore one, okay? And so this is, uh, hopefully you can sort of see why this is so valuable because 
um, from the user's perspective, the developer's perspective, I don't have to worry about managing audio sources or doing anything like that. Uh, all I have to do is tell the audio controller which audio that I want to play right now, and it's going to do that for me. It's going to handle anything that needs to be handled, um, uh, any sort of complexities that may come up when managing audio. I don't have to worry about it. I just have to write this one line of code. And that's really useful for a system like this. Okay, so we also want to be able to stop and restart that same audio. So we'll copy and paste this two more times. We'll say if you press G, then that stops the audio. Same audio type. Um, and then if you press B, then you restart that audio. So we're doing this for a soundtrack. And of course, we're going to end up wanting to test multiple audio playing over each other and testing if they're on the same audio track if one audio type cancels out the other audio type. Um, so there's a couple things we want to test here. So what I want to do is go ahead and copy all of this, paste it down here. Um, I'm just going to move the keys over by one to the right. So I'll say uh, Y, H, and N. And instead of soundtrack one, I'm going to create an enumeration called uh, SFX one. And so here we have two audio types, ST1 and SFX1. And uh, these are mapped to different keys for um, play, stop, and restart, respectively. And uh, we're going to end up wanting to test these on the same audio track as well as different audio tracks to see if they play over each other the way they should and if they cancel each other out the way they should uh, based on our configuration. But when it comes to the test script, I would say that we're about done. And from here, we want to make sure that, uh, first of all, we have this enumeration type defined and that we have the um, API references defined and the audio control. Um, so let's go ahead and do those two things really quick. We'll go to the audio type first because that's the easiest. We'll get into the namespace for Unity Core and the namespace for audio. And we'll create that public enumeration called audio type that we've been passing in and talking about to our functions. So currently we have ST01 and F SFX01. And in this enumeration is where you would add sort of all of your custom audio types. So I'll leave a little comment there. So no matter what your audio type is, I think on the spreadsheet I had some audio types for different gun audio. So here you could put the audio for um, your weapon, so reloading or shooting or misfire. Stuff like that you could put here, uh, but of course the possibilities are endless. Uh, whatever you, whatever type of audio you can think of, you would put in this enumeration. And then whenever you want to play that audio or stop it or restart it, you would simply pass it into the function like this. So it's nice and easy, but for now we have to do the hard part and actually implement the audio controller. So first I want to make sure everything's in the correct namespace and it looks like it is. So I'm gonna go back to the audio controller and now we're gonna map out the skeleton. So up here, we're gonna have some, um, some of our members, some of our like uh, basic data types that would be maybe accessible from the inspector, um, some data structures that we have to fill up like our hash tables. And then we're going to have our regions for our unity functions and our private and public functions. So I'll go ahead and define those regions now. If you guys have been following these tutorials and you kind of you're kind of familiar with this layout, um, of course we're probably going to want uh, in the future, we'll want a static reference to this audio controller. So I'll start off by adding that. So we're going to have a public static audio controller just to maintain that we only have one instance of the audio controller. We don't need multiple instances. Um, at least for our case, since we're building simple mobile games this year, 
Uh, there could be more complicated cases where you would have multiple audio controllers. I can see where that would be a thing. So don't follow this too strictly um, because just keep in mind, I am building this for a simple use case. But uh, after we do implement this, I think it'll be fairly simple to convert to whatever um, specific functionality that you need it for. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of some of the boilerplate uh, or take care of some of the boilerplate in this function. So of course we're going to have a public uh, option for debugging, which means we're going to have some private logging functions down here to begin with. So I'll go ahead and create those logging functions. We'll have the, um, the basic log, which a message could be passed in. First thing we're gonna do in the log function is check to see if we want to debug. And if we don't want to debug, we're going to just return. And if we do want to debug, then we'll actually use the Unity Engine debug object and say debug.log. But uh, the reason that we create these functions is to make it easier for the developer to read whenever output gets sent. So in the brackets here, uh, prepended to all of our log statements for this system, we're going to add the audio controller name, just so we know whenever we're logging from the system, we know exactly uh, right off the bat uh, where this log is coming from. It's really going to help out with debugging. So uh, appended to this, we're going to have the input parameter for message. And then we're just gonna duplicate this in case we have any warnings. We wanna go ahead and create a log warning function. So I'll add that here, log warning. And that means that we would be using the Unity engine uh, debug.log warning function. Okay, so we have our logging taken care of. Let's come back up and if you remember from our spreadsheet, I'll go back so we can reference that. From our spreadsheet, we have two tables. Uh, the first one is a relationship between audio types and audio tracks. That's going to be very handy for us uh, throughout the script. And then we also have the job table, uh, which is another hash table, which is a relationship between running jobs and audio types. Okay, and notice uh, whenever we have these tables, these easy access tables, we're using a common uh, key, which is the audio type. That's going to make it very fluid uh, whenever we script this out. Um, notice that every access is done with an audio type, and that just makes it easy to read. So let's go back to the script and see what we need to do to initialize these tables. Okay, so we're going to have a hash table for the audio, audio table, and then I'll just leave a comment here as a reminder that this is a relationship between audio types, which would be the key, and audio tracks, which would be the value. Okay, and then we're going to have another hash table for jobs. We'll call this the job table. And this is a relationship between audio types, which is the key, and jobs, which is the value. Or we can also think of it as a coroutine or I enumerator. Okay, now that we added the hash tables and we're already talking about coroutines, we can go back up and make sure that we have the correct namespace for that. So we wanna make sure that we're using um, system.collections and then we should be uh, all set for that. Okay, let's go back to the spreadsheet and look over a couple other things just as a reminder. In bold here, we have some specific audio, uh, specific object types that we need to create. We have the audio track audio type, or the audio track object type, which is comprised of an audio source and an array of audio objects. And then we also have to create the audio object, which is uh, defined by an audio type and an audio clip. So let's go ahead and go back to our script and uh, define those in the same namespace. Okay, so we have two new classes that we want to add to help define our audio data structures and manipulate, manipulate those data structures as well. So the first one is going to be our audio object. So we'll create a public class called audio object. And um, I'll explain why, the, why this is public in uh, a little bit, but that does need to be public. So the uh, audio object is defined by an audio type and an audio clip. And just recognize that the audio clip is a built-in Unity function, so we don't need to create that. 
we've already built the audio type. Now the next one is going to be a public class for audio track. And as we just discussed, the audio track is made up of an audio source, and we can call that the source. And then it's also comprised of an array of audio objects. So we can uh, set that up like this, and then just call that audio. Okay. And I would also note that the audio source is uh, also a uh, unity object, so we don't need to define that. And the audio object is something we just defined. Okay, so because the audio source is a member of this audio track class, you, you may have been able to sort of guess that this will be uh, something that we sort of populate from the inspector because we're going to be dragging audio sources onto the audio track um, and then we'll also be expanding the audio object array and adding different audio types and clips from the inspector as well. So what we're going to have is um, a public member attached to this object which will be an array of audio tracks. So we'll have an audio track array and we can call this tracks. But because we're using custom classes uh, and we want this to be accessible from the inspector, we need to add an attribute to the class called system.serializable. And whenever we uh, denote the class with serializable, it just means that Unity can handle um, putting that into the inspector so that we can fill out the uh, data types within the classes. So I'm also going to add that to the audio track. And this is the reason why these classes need to be public. Okay, perfect. So there are going to be other things that we add to the member section here, um, but I will get to those as needed. Uh, once we get to the point where we need to start talking about some of the other things we need to add, I'll go ahead and start talking about that. But for now, we can start off by uh, creating, helping to create the singleton for the audio controller. So uh, anytime I have an instance or a, a static instance to a class, or in other words, anytime I only want one instance of an object to exist in my game, I usually define those in the awake function because I want those to be initialized first so that if somebody is trying to access that object uh, at the start of the game, they can do that in the start function because awake always gets called before start. So here we're going to create the instance. And just to reiterate, um, awake always gets called before start. If there's any object in the game that I want to utilize the the audio controller, I can initialize the audio controller and start because I know by the time the start function gets called, the audio controller instance will have already been created. So we're going to go ahead and create that here. All we're going to do is say if the instance does not exist, then we want to set that to this. And then there will be some other configuration here as well. So we'll end up having a uh, configure uh, method, but we'll get to that in just a second. With this class, we're going to want the ability to dispose of objects in the event that the audio controller gets deleted for whatever reason. Uh, because we have coroutines running on this object, we want to make sure that these uh, jobs, these coroutines, are thrown away or disposed of in the event that the object is deleted. We don't want anything running in the background because that could potentially cause a memory leak. So we're going to have an on disable uh, unity function definition here. And any time the, the object is disabled, we just want to call this dispose function. And uh, I suppose right now we can go ahead and call configure here. And I'll end up defining the instance in that configure function as well. So dispose hasn't been created yet, uh, neither has configure, but we can go ahead and define those now. So in configure, we're going to be doing everything we need to do to initialize this object. In dispose, we're getting rid of anything that could potentially cause memory leaks in the event that the 
audio controller gets deleted, but it shouldn't, but we do this as a safeguard. So down here in the private function section, we're going to go ahead and create both of those uh, method definitions. So we're going to have a configure, which is where all of our initialization is going to happen. And then we're also going to have the dispose function. Okay, and before I forget, I wanna go ahead and make sure the first thing I do in configure is initialize the instance. Okay, now we're going to have the uh, hash tables up here. We wanna make sure that we initialize those in the configure function as well. Those only need to be initialized once. So we can say the audio table is simply a new hash table. Same thing with the job table. Okay, now if we scroll up, we can remember that we have this, this uh, audio track array that we need to initialize from the inspector. Um, the audio track array is going to have an array of audio sources which are going to represent our tracks and um, tied in with the sources is, are going to be uh, arrays of audio which are comprised of audio types and audio clips. So um, because we're defining this from the inspector we want to end up converting this array of tracks into the audio table. So what we're going to want is a way of generating or populating that uh, audio table. Because when we first start off, it's completely empty. We have this public tracks variable, and we want to move that data into something that's more usable for the script, which is going to be inside this hash table called audio table. So let's create a, a, a new function down here. And the name of this function is going to be something like generate, you can also say populate, um, but we can say generate audio table. And this is going to be using the tracks, uh, the public tracks variable to populate our audio table. And that's going to be the last thing that we actually do in our configure function. Uh, but before we actually implement, before we actually implement this method, uh, I wanna go ahead and go back to Unity and actually populate this, this tracks um, object, this array of tracks, so that we can understand a little bit more closely exactly what that is. Um, and then once we sort of understand that more fully, we'll come back and we'll implement this generate audio table. Okay, so back here in Unity, you'll notice that you might have a couple of errors in the console. That's simply because in our test audio script, we were, um, we were implementing some methods that we haven't created yet, the play audio, stop audio, and restart audio. Uh, before we actually modify anything in the inspector, we need to take care of these errors. So let's go back to the script and make sure that we uh, implement those functions. And then we'll go ahead and just come back and uh, start, start off where we um, left off. Okay, so we have some public functions that we need to implement. Um, as you can see from our test function, we have the play, stop, and restart audio. Let's go ahead and add those, and the only parameter that they're taking for now is going to be this audio type. Okay, so we're going to have public void uh, play audio. It'll accept an audio type. And then we'll just duplicate this twice. And then we'll have stop audio and restart audio. And that should take care of our errors. We'll see. Let's go back to Unity and make sure that those errors are taken care of. Okay, so everything looks good. I want to go ahead and before I forget, I'll add the test audio, the test audio script to uh, our audio controller or to our tests object rather. And in the core systems, I'll add the audio controller. I'll make sure that I'm checking debug and then I'll make sure that I'm dragging that audio controller into the test audio function. So we'll get to actually using this um, a little bit later. But what I wanted to do is populate this tracks, uh, this tracks object here. So let's go ahead and add one. So with one track, that means that we have one audio source with multiple um, audio clips. So let's say we have one audio source here. We need to go ahead and create that audio source. And um, 
I, I sort of want the, wherever the audio controller is, is where I'm going to want the audio sources because for, for our particular use case, uh, for the games that we're going to be creating this year, we're going to have, um, we're going to have global audio pretty much everywhere. So all of our audio sources can follow the audio controller. And with that being said, we're going to create the, the audio sources as children of our audio controller. And uh, I'll rename this audio source to be soundtracks. And then we'll also end up having another audio source for sound effects. So we have two audio sources there. Now, I don't need to do anything else with these audio sources. If you want, of course, uh, for a specific audio source, if you want to uh, play with some of these other settings, you're more than welcome to do that. But we're focused purely on the management of these audio sources. So we have one track defined in our audio controller. We're just gonna go ahead and drag the soundtracks audio source onto that source. And then we wanna go ahead and define which audio types belong to the soundtrack. So let's say that we have one audio type that would play off of the soundtrack, and that would be the soundtrack one. And then we wanna find an audio clip for this. So there are a couple places that you can get audio for free. Um, I'll leave a link in the description to a couple sources where you can find some free audio. You just go there, download the audio, bring it back to Unity, uh, you'll want either a WAV file or an MP3 file. Either one should work. Drag them into your assets folder, and then you'll go ahead and simply drag that in to this, uh, this clip field. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. I have a couple of uh, soundtracks and sound effects that I have laying around, and I'm just going to drag those into my project. Okay, so I created a folder called audio and then some subfolders uh, sort of categorizing the audio. Um, and so I'm gonna come back to our audio controller. And here I have the soundtrack one audio type. I'm just gonna add an audio clip um, for, the, for the soundtrack. So on the soundtrack, I can also add uh, another audio type. So let's say I never want a certain sound effect to play while the soundtrack is playing. Um, in that case, I would put them on the same soundtrack because according to our rules, we can never have two audio types on the same soundtrack playing at the same time because of course they utilize the same sound source. And a sound source can only have uh, one audio playing at a time. So I'll choose a sound effect here and then we'll end up testing that um, in a moment after we implement some more of the script. So as you can see here, we'll have the ability to have multiple tracks. So here we'll have multiple tracks and we'll say that uh, this element one will be our SFX soundtrack audio source. And, um, and then we'll, we'll end up creating more audio types here to have for the sound effects. So let's go back and create a couple more audio types really quick, and then we can fill this out a little bit more logically. Okay, so our audio types here, we'll end up adding another soundtrack audio type, and then one more SFX audio type. And we'll go back to Unity and start using these. Okay, so for our first uh, audio track, we have soundtracks. And let's just say we only want soundtracks to be playing on this audio track. So we'll have ST1 and ST2. I'm gonna go ahead and use my second soundtrack here. And then in our second audio track, we have the SFX audio source. And we only wanna use SFX1 and SFX2. And then I'll use two of my sound effects for each one of those respective clips. Okay, so uh, I'll expand this a little bit so we can see the whole thing at once. Currently we have two audio tracks. One is the soundtrack audio track. The other one is the sound effects audio track. And each one of those tracks has two audio clips that can be played. 
So the soundtracks audio track has ST1 and ST2, and the SFX audio track has SFX1 and SFX2. So what we end up wanting to uh, what we'll end up wanting to do is tell our audio controller to um, play one of these, and then it'll automatically find the audio track. To make that really easy from script, uh, we have the audio table, which is going to give us a direct reference from the audio type to the entire track object. So we can easily pull the track object by just referring to the audio type. So with that said, let's go back to the script and start populating or start creating that generate audio table function. Okay, so as you can see, if you remember uh, in our configure function, we have this generate audio table and we wanna go ahead and implement that now. Okay, because uh, we're using the tracks object, that public member and the inspector, we wanna just go ahead and start off by iterating through that. So we're gonna iterate through some audio tracks. And then we want to iterate across all of the objects in each individual track. Remember the audio object is a, a, an audio type and an audio clip. So we'll also iterate through audio object And then we're grabbing that audio uh, for each audio object. You know, we're, we're going to be looking for the audio type and adding that to our audio table. And remember that this only gets called once. So even though this is a nested for loop, it's really not going to impact performance at all. I'm gonna leave a little comment here just to remind myself, I do not want to duplicate keys. So don't duplicate keys. And what that means is we're going to be checking uh, before we add things into our audio table, we're going to be checking to make sure the audio table doesn't already have that, that audio type. So what we'll do is we'll say if the audio table contains the key for that audio type. So remember this this object uh, parameter here, that is this object parameter that is referring to this object. So we have the type field and the clip field, and we're referring to this type field here. So if the audio table already contains that type, that audio type, then we want to go ahead and warn the developer and tell them that uh, they're trying to register the same audio clip twice, and that's going to end up breaking things. Or it'll end up uh, giving them behavior that they didn't expect. So we're gonna log a warning here, and we can say, you're trying to register audio, and then we'll tell them what that audio is. So that'll be object.type. So you're trying to register audio that has already been registered. Okay, and then we'll just say otherwise. So if we haven't already added this to the audio table, then we'll go ahead and add that. So all we have to do is say the audio table should add the object type. And uh, what we wanna reference with that object type is the track itself. So we can pass the entire track object in there. And then we wanna go ahead and just log that the audio is being registered so we can say registering audio, and then we'll pass in that object type like this. Okay, just a little bit of confirmation for the developers so that uh, we know things are actually working the way that they should be. Okay, now I think we should go back up to our main functions here that are pretty much going to define how the rest of this class works. I think we should come up here and start thinking about how we want to implement this. So. We have the audio table, hash table, which is going to help us access the tracks with the audio type alone. And um, we can also think that we have three different jobs here or three different job types. So one of our job types is to play, another type is to stop, and another type is to restart. So those are our three different job types. So what we can think about as we're implementing this class 
is we're running different jobs. So we're running a job to play, stop, or restart audio. And that job could entail some complexities with how we want to sort of play that audio. Um, like I said previously in this video, one of the things that we're going to be doing is fading audio in and out, and that requires a coroutine. So we can think of these coroutines as individual jobs. And each coroutine is going to be checking to see if we're playing, stopping, or restarting the audio. So here's kind of how this is going to look. Whenever we actually go to play the audio, we want to have a function that adds a job for us. And we don't really want to have to worry about anything else up to this point. We just want to, we just know that we're adding a job of a certain type. So keep in mind that add job hasn't been created yet. And then we're going to add a, we're going to end up creating an object that defines a job. So this has also not been created yet. We have the, uh, we're going to say add job and we'll say new audio job. And the audio job is going to, to define some specific parameters for each one of our jobs. One of those being the job type, which would be play, stop, or restart. Okay, so don't, don't worry too much about this right now. It's, it hasn't been implemented yet, but we're going to implement it soon. Okay, so every time somebody tries to do something, we're going to call this function add job, new audio job. And one thing that we're definitely going to be passing in is going to be the type. Uh, but before that, we'll say that we'll have an audio or we'll have yeah, an audio job type called start. Or maybe we can call this something like audio action. Okay. And so that audio action in this case is going to be start. And we want to start on this type. Okay. We can duplicate this line here and then simply change the audio action and the type is a parameter that's passed in. So we don't have to change that. Okay, so there's uh, a few things here that we need to end up adding. We have to create the add job function. We need to create a new class for the audio job, which will define several parameters for our jobs. And then we also need to create this enumeration for audio action. And what this is doing is it's sort of setting us up for the ability to extend the class to have different responsibilities for audio. Right now, we only have three responsibilities, so it's pretty simple. But uh, what we're doing is we're creating these data structures that will end up helping us extend functionality later. So let's go ahead and create the audio job and the audio action. We'll come up to the top here, and we'll end up having a private class. Since this doesn't need to be accessed outside of the class, we can make it private, and we'll call this audio job. And then we'll also have an enumeration that can also be private called audio action. And the audio action will have start, stop, and restart uh, actions for now. And then we want to talk about what's going to be going into our audio job class. Okay, so the first thing in our audio job is the action that we're taking. So we'll have a public audio action called action. We'll have the audio type. And for now, that's all we need to worry about. So we'll have the audio type here. And now we're going to want the, the constructor to help us populate these fields for action and type. So we'll have the audio action get passed in and the audio type. And we're simply going to initialize our uh, public members for this class according to the parameters that get passed into the constructor. So action equals action and type is equal to type. So we have our audio job created and our audio action. So that was pretty painless. If we come back down, we still need to add the add job function. That's going to be a private function. So we can add that down here in our private functions area. We can have a function called add job. And the value that gets passed in is the audio job type. So we want to make sure that we add that parameter here. 
Okay, so when we add a job, we're going to do two main things. The first thing we're going to do is remove any conflict jobs. So remove conflicting jobs. The second thing we're gonna do is actually add the job and actually start the job. So we can say start job here. So when I say remove conflicting jobs, we're going to have to think about cases where a job comes in for an audio type that has an audio source that's already executing a job. So let me go back to the spreadsheet to help explain this a little bit. So we're talking about conflicting audio jobs. Let's say that we have a job for soundtrack one, which remember all of these uh, sound types, all of these audio types run on the same audio track. So let's say audio or uh, soundtrack one is playing and then the developer says that we should start playing soundtrack two. Well, in that case, we have to make sure that we stop any jobs that might be running on this soundtrack. So we don't want two jobs from the same soundtrack running at the same time. We have to make sure that we turn those off. Even if those jobs are only running for uh, one or two seconds, you know, to fade the audio in or out, there's still a chance that those audio types could be conflicting um, say if we play one audio type and then we play the next audio type quickly thereafter. Um, and so we're sort of handling edge cases here, but it's an important edge case to take care of. So in the event that ST1 is playing and then we decide to play ST2, we want to make sure that the job for ST1 is no longer running. Now the other case where a job might be considered a conflict is whenever we, um, whenever we play, say, ST1, but then right after we tell it to play ST1 again. So we're going to check our job table to see if uh, ST1 is already in there. And if it is, then we're just not going to do anything. Or we might just remove the first, uh, the first job and then add the new one that's coming in. So I hope that makes sense. We're going to go ahead and implement that now. So let's go back to the script and see what all of this looks like. So this remove conflicting jobs function is going to be pretty involved. So we'll separate that out into its own method. We'll call it remove conflicting jobs, and then we'll pass in the actual job. We can just pass in the type actually of the job that's coming in to be added. Um, now we wanna start the job. So what does starting the job look like? Um, starting the job is going to be uh, actually collecting a reference to the coroutine which hasn't been created yet, uh, but we will eventually have a coroutine that defines the running job. So that could look something like the I enumerator reference, we'll call it a job runner, and we'll say that's equal to run audio job. Okay, and this run audio job is going to be the coroutine that we end up creating to actual actually handle fading the audio in, um, waiting for delays for audio or any, any other sort of audio settings that might get passed in to the play, stop, and restart functions. Okay, so we have a reference to the job runner and this is the reason that we created the job table so that we could have a relationship between the job type and the actual job in the event that you know we need to remove jobs in case they're conflicting. So let's go ahead and use the job table so we'll add to the job table the job type and give that the reference to the job runner. And then here uh, below this, we can go ahead and add some logging just to confirm with the developer um, that everything is working the way it should be. So we'll just add a generic log here that says starting job on the job type with the operation job.action. Okay, so we wanna go ahead now and implement this remove conflicting jobs function. Let's go ahead and add that down here. And that's going to accept an audio type. 
So the first thing that we want to do, the first conflict is pretty easy. The first conflict is simply checking to see if our job table already has the job type in it. And if it does, then we can go ahead and um, either remove it or just move on. In this case, we're going to go ahead and remove the job that was added first so that the new job can execute. So let's go ahead and say if the job table, uh, let's see, if, if job table contains key, that's the easiest way to do it. If it contains that type, then we just remove the job. Okay, so we'll end up having a function called remove job, and that'll handle removing that job from the job table. Okay, um, now we want to check for the other case, which is a little bit more complicated. If we have soundtrack one playing, and then we go to try to play soundtrack two, and both of those audio types use the same audio source, then we have a conflict because we can't have those two jobs running at the same time. In that instance, we would want to remove the job for soundtrack one. So what we want to do is look for conflict audio. And we'll initialize a variable for audio type called conflict audio. And we'll initialize that to audio type dot none. Um, and I can't remember actually if I added the none type uh, with, with enumerations. Usually that's a good idea. Okay, so it looks like I didn't. I'll go to the audio type and add the none type. Okay, so we have conflict audio defined here. Now we want to loop through our job table. So we're going to loop through in this way. We'll say for each dictionary entry. So uh, essentially this is like saying for, for every um, key value pair that we have in the job table, we want to, we want to check to see if the audio for uh, one of the types, if the audio track for one of the types is equal to the audio track for the type that we're trying to play. Okay. So first let's get the audio type of this entry. It's going to look like if audio type, I'm sorry. Let's see, we're going to grab the audio type. Uh, all we need to do is convert this like so, and then grab the key of the dictionary entry. Okay, so with this, we get the key value of the entry, uh, which is going to, of course, be an audio type. Uh, and so we're, uh, what we're doing right here is we're looking through all of the audio types that are currently in the job table. And then with that, we want to get the track of the audio type. Okay, so uh, for this audio type, for instance, we'll say the audio track, and we'll call this our audio track in use. So the audio track in use is going to be equal to um, our audio table indexed at the audio type. And this will have to be casted into the audio track object, just like this. Okay, so, um, so far we're looping through every job in the table. We're grabbing the audio type and the audio track associated with that job. Okay, so these are the running types. These are the 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 track that uh, is currently being utilized by a job right now. Hopefully, this makes sense. It's a little bit uh, complicated, so if you need to, um, just take some time to let it set in, uh, and then try to keep going. <laughs> but it, I can understand it, it gets a little bit complicated at times, and uh, this is a system that. I've obviously been working on to prepare for the tutorial. And so I have a little bit of a better understanding with it, but if you have questions about this specific function or anything really in the script, of course, you can feel free to comment below or contact me directly. And uh, we can settle any confusion that you might have. Okay, but moving along here, uh, we have the audio track in use. We also want the audio track needed. So we can create audio track audio track needed. And this is the actual audio track that the job coming in is going to use. And then we'll essentially just compare these two tracks 
If they're the same, that means we have a conflict. Okay, so audio track needed is going to be uh, similar to the line above, audio track casted from the audio table, except the audio track that we're looking for is the type that gets passed in from the parameter, which is our incoming job type. Okay. Uh, so essentially what we do now is we just compare these two. So if the audio track needed, if the source of that audio track is equal to the audio track in use, then we know we have a conflict. Okay. And with that conflict, we set the conflict audio equal to the audio type. And so this audio type is the active job that we're looking at as we're iterating through the job table. Okay. So the reason that we don't just remove the job here is because we're actively iterating across the job table and you can't be removing entries from a table as you're iterating through it. You'll end up getting uh, an exception thrown and that's no good obviously so that's why we store this audio type that we uh, call conflict in its own separate variable and then what we'll do is after we iterate over the jobs table we'll go ahead and remove that like this uh, but first we check to see if the conflict if the conflict audio is still equal to none okay if it's not equal to none then we know that there's a conflict and we can go ahead and remove that job conflict audio. Okay. And that's all we need to do for our conflicting jobs. Um, we have a new function here that we haven't implemented called remove job. And we also added the call to the coroutine here when we're initializing the job runner, we need to go ahead and implement that, uh, coroutine as well. Just as a quick aside, um, with some of these tutorials, I know they get a little bit complicated. Uh, if you guys appreciate the way that I am teaching this to you now, then let me know. Uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and uh, drop a like on the video. If you don't really like my teaching style and it seems complicated or you just don't understand what I'm talking about, um, leave a comment in the comment section as well. Let me know. Um, I'm always uh, welcoming uh, constructive criticism. Of course, uh, I know that some of these topics also, uh, I have a wide audience. Uh, some people are obviously more advanced than others. And uh, I know that sometimes I'll just, I'll sort of rush over some topics that some people might not understand. Um, and it's easy for some people and it's not easy for other people. So if you think that, uh, if you have any recommendations for how I could sort of change the format of the videos, go ahead and let me know. I appreciate all the feedback that I get, of course. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and implement this remove job function. So we'll put this under the add job function. Uh, we'll just say it's uh, private void, remove job, and then this is accepting an audio type. So what type of job do we want to remove? And then we're just going to check first if this type exists in the job table, because of course we always want to do error checking. So we'll say, you know, if the job table doesn't have the key for this audio type, then we're not really going to do anything. And we'll go ahead and let the developer know that they're trying to remove a job uh, that doesn't exist. So we'll, we'll leave a little bit of a warning here. And we'll just say, you're trying to stop a job that is not running. Just to let them know, um, that there might be an issue with how they're using the audio controller. Um, and uh, maybe this sort of comment would uh, let them sort of revisit their implementation and maybe fix some things uh, that they didn't think about. So that's why we add these comments here. They're, they're just there to help the person who's using this system. Okay, so after we check to make sure the, uh, the job table actually contains the audio type, we can go ahead and safely remove that. So all we need to do is grab the, the actual job. So that's going to be the job runner equal to casted job table at the 
audio type. Okay, so once we have, or instead of calling this job runner, I guess we can call it running job, so it's a little bit more readable. So we're grabbing the running job, um, and then we wanna stop that, essentially. We wanna stop the running job. So we can just say stop coroutine, running job, and now finally we can remove it from the actual table. So all we have to do is say job table dot remove and type. Okay, so we have the remove job function uh, implemented. Now we wanna go ahead and get to this coroutine. This is pretty much the meat of this class. And uh, again, and this run audio job coroutine. This is where we'll implement any sort of complex audio manipulation logic. Um, what we're going to be doing is pretty simple. We're just going to be controlling the ability to fade in the audio and fade out the audio as needed. Um, we might also end up adding a delay. So there will be an optional delay parameter and the play, stop, and restart functions. And that would be a simple wait at the beginning of the coroutine before we actually execute the job action. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and stop talking about it and just start implementing it. Um, let's see, find a convenient place. Wherever you wanna put it is fine. I guess it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll add it up here. Um, we'll have the I enumerator run audio job, and that's going to be accepting the actual job. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is grab the audio track for this job. So we can say the audio track is going to be equal to the casted audio table at the index of job type. Once we have the track, we can get the clip. So getting the clip from the track is a little bit more complicated. We have to iterate through the objects and the track. So what I want to do is uh, say that the track dot source dot clip, so the actual audio source on the clip, that's going to be equal to a new function called get audio clip from audio track. And then we'll just pass in the job type that we're looking for. So the audio clip will be paired with the type. So we'll pass that in and the actual track. So at this point, uh, after we implement this function, let's just assume that we uh, currently have a reference to the track and we've already set the clip to the appropriate clip associated with the job type. The next thing we can do is switch on the job action. So let's create a switch statement called, uh, or a switch statement on the job action. We'll just say switch job action and then the case that we're looking for is of course the audio action dot start, the audio action dot stop, and finally restart. So when we start, what we wanna do is say uh, simply track dot source dot play. So the source remember is a unity object and on that unity object we have a method called play which is just simply going to play the audio pretty straightforward okay with stop what we what we want to do is simply say track dot source dot stop just like that and then for restart we simply call stop and then play so we can say track dot source dot stop and then track dot source dot play. When we come back and implement fading, there'll be some changes to this, but just to make sure it even works at all, uh, we'll leave things as they are to keep them as simple as possible. And uh, not to say that this has been simple by any means, this has already gone on for about an hour, uh, but let's just say we keep it like this until we actually introduce the process of fading things in and out. Okay, because with this logic right now, we don't even need a coroutine. Uh, we don't have any sort of waiting or we don't have any need to yield, but we will get to that. Okay, so 
Um, the rest of the logic that we'll need for this is um, actually fading logic. Uh, so we're not going to worry about that right now. So the last thing that we're going to be doing in the coroutine is simply removing the job from the job table. So we can just say uh, job table dot remove job dot type. Okay, and that's all we have to do there. Um, so we can also uh, just to make sure that all of our logic is working, we can make sure that uh, we keep track of the amount of jobs in our job table, just to make sure that there aren't any coroutines that are running without us knowing. So we can go ahead and log that here. We can say the job, the current job count, is equal to m job table count. And again, what this lets us know is how many running jobs we have after this job finishes. So uh, for our tests, we would just hope to see that around zero as much as possible. Um, but based on your specific implementation, uh, you might see higher job counts for longer periods of time. Okay, so we have a new function here, get audio clip from audio track. That's gonna be pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and implement that. Um, I'll bring that implementation down here. So we wanna return an audio clip and we'll call this get audio clip from audio track. And we'll pass in the audio track as a parameter. Okay, so what we wanna do is loop through each of these tracks uh, potential audio clips. So we'll say for each audio object in the, in the track dot audio. Okay, so for each potential object, we just say if the object.type is equal to, uh, I forgot, there's a second parameter here that we're checking for. We're, we're actually looking for the type. I think we actually made that the first parameter. So if audio type, if the object type is equal to that type, then we know that we can get the audio clip and go ahead and return that. So we can return the clip. Otherwise, we just return null. And that audio clip field in the audio source will remain empty and nothing will really happen. Okay, and before we forget, we wanna implement this last function, the, this dispose function, which is responsible for simply canceling any potential uh, running jobs. So let's go ahead and loop through each one of our jobs here. We'll say for each dictionary entry, entry in the job table. We wanna grab that job, which will be equal to the casted entry, and the actual value for that entry. So we wanna grab that job and just stop the coroutine. So we can say stop coroutine on that job. Okay, now we can go back to Unity and see if any of this even works. So let's go back and check it out. So um, I would be surprised if we didn't have any errors and it looks like we have a few. So let's go ahead and resolve these errors. Type or namespace audio tracks. So that's just a typo. Um, can't convert audio track to audio type. So let's just go through each one of these one by one. So that's obviously a typo. can't implicitly convert audio type to audio track. Let's see what's going on with this one. Okay, so that was just a typo here. Let's change that to audio track. Of course, this is um, the correct value to be casting because we're trying to get the track. Um, let's go back and see what else we have. Okay, job doesn't can, uh, exist in the current context. Looks like I'm just missing an, an underscore on that one. And then the last one is our coroutine not returning anything. So let's resolve these two here. Okay, uh, this job needs an underscore. And because this is a coroutine and we're not doing anything particularly interesting yet with the coroutine, uh, we wanna make sure that we remember to just yield return null. Okay, so with that, uh, I think I ended up changing the audio type uh, the audio types enumeration. So let's fix some of these fields here. We want uh, ST1 and ST2 on our tracks and 
uh, SFX1 and SFX2. Okay, but remember our, our testing function is only actually dealing with ST1 and SFX1. If you want to add additional test conditions uh, for these other sound effects or these audio types, you can feel free to do that. Just copy and paste some of those conditions and use the function that you want, uh, whether that's play, stop, or restart. So I think everything is set up. Uh, we want to be modifying. Uh, we, we just want to be seeing if we can play, stop, and restart ST1 and SFX1. So let's go ahead and play. And those keys were TGB for ST1 and YHN for SFX1. We can see from our logs that we are registering all of the audio types. So that is good. I'll clear this out. I'll press T. We can see that we, well, we have two test scripts firing off right now. Uh, probably a good idea to disable the other test scripts while you're testing a system. Um, so when I press T, we can see starting job ST1 with operation start. Um, however, I can't hear any audio, so let's see what we can do about that. Okay, so from the add job function, uh, we added the job to the table, but we never started that coroutine. So obviously nothing's going to happen. Let's go ahead and call start coroutine on this and we're gonna pass in the job runner. Let's go back to Unity and see if we can actually hear the audio now. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I remember to disable these other testing scripts since we probably have some overlap with the testing keys. Let's go ahead and play again and I'll hit T. Should play soundtrack one. Okay, and if I hit G, that should stop soundtrack one. Okay, and uh, you can also see we have the job count firing off, that log firing off. Um, I would always expect to see job count at zero. I don't want uh, these coroutines running for very long. And right now they shouldn't be running at all because we're not waiting or uh, fading in or any of that. So this is exactly what I would expect to see. Uh, let's try uh, playing it again. So we'll play it and then we'll use B to restart the audio. Okay, so that works. I'll hit G to stop. So we can see the log coming in with restart. And uh, let's go ahead and try the sound effect. So I'll use Y, H, and N for the sound effect. So Y should play it. Okay, so Y played the sound effect. If I hit Y and then H really quickly, it should start playing and then stop about halfway through. Okay, and then if I hit if I hit N, then it just keeps restarting. So uh, everything is working exactly the way we need it to right now. Um, and let's go back to our test scripts just so we can appreciate this for what it's doing. Okay, so remember all we're doing here is um, calling these simple single line functions and the system is handling everything else for us. It's handling multiple tracks the way that we would expect to. Of course, we, we can do some more testing around this. I actually want to before we move forward. Um, let's let's try to break this a little bit. Um, let's see, we're, we're dealing with ST1 and SFX1, so that's fine. Let's go back to Unity and try to break this. So one thing that we can do to try to break it is go to our tracks and um, let's, let's, uh, let's remove this second track here. So I'll set the size to one and for our second element on this track, I'll use SFX one, and um, we can just keep that soundtrack in there. Okay, so let's play this again. Now, because these are on the same soundtrack, we shouldn't be able to let them, we shouldn't be able to hear them play together. So I'll hit T for soundtrack one, then I'll hit Y for, for um, soundtrack two, or for SFX one rather. And so those two can't play together simultaneously. That's exactly what we want. Okay. Um, conversely, if we if we stop Unity really quick, let's put these on separate audio tracks again. So I'll create a second audio track. I'll get re I'll remove that second element there. 
and I'll use this audio source. SFX one. Okay, so same exact thing. Let's see, same exact thing, except now uh, these are on two different audio tracks. So let's play again, and we should be able to hear these two playing at the same exact time. So I'll hit T for the first one, and then Y for the second one. So both of those are playing at the same time. I can hit H, gets rid of that second audio source. I'll hit Y again. I'll hit G to get rid of the first audio source. Okay. So uh, everything seems to be working exactly the way we want it to. One other thing that I'll do is I'll, I'll play the first audio and I'll keep trying to play it. So let's see here. So no matter how much I play it, you can see the job count is always zero. Um, and so we're not actually, this will be more evident once we have more time on these coroutines, but um, we're not actually seeing the job count go above. We're not, we're not actually seeing the job count go above zero, um, even though I'm spamming the, the job to start multiple times. And that's because we're resolving those conflicts. That's what the the conflict was there for, that conflict function, okay? Um, so we have a couple more things to do, even though this tutorial is running a little bit long, it's okay. Um, something that I think is really cool with a system like this is adding more complexity to the, the audio itself. And one of the ways we can do that is by simply fading the audio in when we start it and fading it out when we stop it. So let's see uh, if we can implement that really quickly. Then we can go ahead and close this tutorial off and uh, call it finished. So let's go back to our test script. Okay, and what we want to see from our test script is something like the ability to um, pass in a, a Boolean for whether we should fade in or not, just to keep it as simple as possible. Alternatively, you could um, alternatively, you could go ahead and pass in a float to specify the amount of time you or how fast you want the fade to happen. But we're going to have a constant fade time of about one second. And we're just going to make it super easy for the user of the system to say whether they want fading or not. So they can simply say true. And if they don't want fading, they can just leave it blank. Okay. Another thing that we're also going to add here is an optional parameter is uh, a delay, which is sometimes useful for these types of systems. So we can say there's a delay of one second for playing the audio, but there's no delay for stopping it. You know, uh, the stuff like that, that we can play around with. Um, and these are both optional parameters, so we don't need either of them. However, if you don't want fading, but you want a delay, you'll have to specify false for the second parameter here. Okay. So let's test this out here. Um, SFX won't have any fading and the uh, ST1 will have fading and whenever we play, we'll actually have a, a one second delay before it actually plays. So let's go back to the audio controller here and we'll just modify some of these public functions with the optional parameters. So here we'll have our second parameter um, called fade and we'll initialize that to false and then we'll also have a float for delay we'll initialize that to zero so there's not uh, always going to be a delay for these okay and then I'll just propagate these parameters through the other functions uh, and then we'll want to go ahead and build out our audio job with these new parameters okay and to do that all we have to do is simply pass them into the audio job constructor so we'll pass fade and delay into those. And then again, I'll pass those same parameters down for all of these. Okay, so a little bit of duplication, but not too much. Um, because we added these uh, new parameters to the constructor, we need to go ahead and add those to the actual class definition. So let's scroll up. We have for the audio job constructor, the third parameter would be a Boolean 
for fade, and the fourth parameter would be a float for delay time. And then we'll add those public, uh, to make them publicly accessible up here, we'll add the public bool definition and the float. And then finally initialize those in the constructor. Okay, and now that that's done, because we are uh, simply propagating the audio job object through to the constructor, we can immediately take advantage of those new properties. So this is kind of what I was talking about when we were implementing these uh, public parameters. Um, this line may have seemed confusing at first, but hopefully now you can see when it comes to extending the uh, capability of the system, all we do is simply add new parameters, pass them through the audio job, and our main running coroutine is just immediately going to have access to those new settings. Okay, so let's see what we have to do to, uh, what, what modifications we have for this. The first thing we have is the delay, so we can add that at the very beginning of our coroutine, so pretty simple there. So all we have to do is say, uh, you know, yield return new wait for seconds, and then we just pass in that delay, just like that. And just like that, we have the option to have delays um, in our API. The next thing is a little bit more complicated. We'll have the ability to look for fading. Um, now, one important thing to remember is if we want to fade the audio out whenever we call stop, then we don't want the source to stop the audio immediately. Uh, we want the source to stop the audio after the volume has reached zero. So uh, one thing we want to do here is when we're switching on our action, we want to see if the job wants us to fade. And if it doesn't want us to fade, we don't want to do anything. We don't want to do anything with this yet. Okay, so if, if the job doesn't want us to fade out, we can immediately stop the source. But if we are fading, then we don't want to stop the source until the very end of this coroutine. Um, with playing, it's different because we want to start playing as we are gradually increasing the volume. Okay, so after we do that, uh, and before we actually remove this from the job table, we want to go ahead and check to see if we're fading. And if we are fading, then we actually need to start lerping the volume from zero to one or from one to zero, depending on the audio action. Okay, so ultimately we're gonna be lerping from an initial value to a target value. Uh, and that value is going to be directly affecting the volume of our audio source. So first let's define an initial value. So our initial value will be based on the audio action. If, if our audio action is start, then our initial value should be zero because we're going from zero to one. If our audio action is stop, our initial value should be one because we're trying to uh, make the volume go uh, more quiet. So we're trying to go from one to zero. And just in case you don't know, um, with Unity, the audio is from a value of zero to one, where zero is completely silent and one is the loudest you can get. So our initial value that we're lerping from is going to be based on the action, right? So we can say um, it's going to be equal to whether or not the job action is equal to audio action dot start or restart, right? Because if we're restarting, then we still want to hear the audio. So we'll say job action equals audio action dot restart. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're saying uh, if the action is either start or restart, then we set the initial value to zero. Otherwise, uh, in this case, we're assuming, because we only have these three uh, action types, otherwise, we're assuming that the audio action is stop, in which case we want to start from one. And then with our target, we can say the target is dependent on the initial value. So if the initial if the initial value is equal to zero, then we want the target to be one. Otherwise, we want the target to be zero. Okay, and then we can define a duration. So how long do we want this 
fading to last. Well, you can parameterize this with a public value, um, and that could be also passed in through the play, stop, and restart functions as well. But here, in this case, I'm just going to make it a constant value of one. So I'll just say the duration is going to be equal to one second, and then we'll have a timer to help us lerp which will be equal to zero initially. Okay, so we have all of our variables defined here, which is a good start. Just a few more lines of code left and we should be good to go. We wanna go ahead and um, lerp while the timer is less than duration. Then we want to actually say the track.source.volume is equal to that lerp, so lerp where we're lerping from the initial value to the target value. And the current time would be timer divided by duration. Okay, so um, in case you don't understand how lerp works, we're going from an initial value to a target value, and that's on a normalized scale. So if this third parameter is equal to zero, then we're equal to our initial. If this third parameter is one, then we're equal to our target. So uh, this value should be a value from zero to one. And as you can see here, we're saying if the timer is less than duration, so uh, we can actually say less than or equal to, just to make sure we get all the way to the end. Um, so timer is always going to be less than or equal to duration. If you imagine uh, at the peak of this loop, timer is equal to duration, then, it's, then this value is going to be one. But at the very beginning of the loop, timer is equal to zero. Zero divided by anything is zero, of course. Um, so you can see with this loop, we're going, uh, we're, we're moving this third parameter from zero to one. Okay, essentially that's what we're doing with the lerp function, which means that our track volume is slowly moving from zero to one as well, um, or from one to zero based on the action. Okay, so the next thing that we wanna do in here is increment the timer based on delta time, and then we can go ahead and yield. Okay, at this point, once we've gotten out of the loop, our lerp is finished, and we can say if the job action is uh, stop, so if it's audio action not stop, now we can finally stop the source. Okay, hopefully all of that makes sense, and that should be the end of the scripting part. Let's go ahead and go back to Unity to see if this fading actually works. Okay, so based on some of the changes that we made to the testing function, we know that uh, the soundtrack one should always fade, the sound effects should not fade, and the soundtrack will have a one second delay whenever we use the play function. So let's go ahead and start this and see if all that's true. So remember, the key, or uh, the, the T key is used to play soundtrack one. When I tap that, there should be a one second delay. Let's look at the logs here and compare that log with the uh, actual audio playing. And there should be about a one second delay. So I'll press it now. Okay, we can see that, we can see that that uh, start that start log happened about one second before the audio actually started playing. You'll also notice that the uh, audio fades out. So it fades in, and then when I stop the actual audio, it fades out, it takes about a second to fade out, so that sounds like it's working. And then just to make sure that if we don't pass in um, the true parameter for fading, that it doesn't actually fade. So we can test that by using our uh, SFX1 enumerator. So we can use Y to start playing uh, on the other audio track. And that just starts and stops without any fading. So everything appears to be working. If you guys have any issues with this system, please let me know. Um, if you have any recommendations to the teaching style again, let me know. I know this video went on for a long time and some people have been requesting that uh, these these tutorials get chopped up if they're if they run a little bit longer. Um, but with this case, I feel like 
since it's already part of a Game Essentials series, I don't want to break it out into a sub-series. So I'm going to keep this as one long video. It's an important topic. So if you got lost in um, any of the implementation, just go back and rewatch it until you understand exactly what's going on. Um, but as always, thank you guys so much for your support. Drop a like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you guys in the next video.